You are listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. My co-host today is Michelle Jewell Shaw, award-winning volunteer and chairperson of Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Jeremy, and hello to all of our listeners out there. This is episode 106 of Lighthearted, slated for February 21st, 2021. So what's happened on this date in Lighthouse history, Michelle? I'm glad you asked, Jeremy. On February 21st, 1795, Congress appropriated $5,000 for a lighthouse at the entrance to the harbor of Georgetown, South Carolina. The first lighthouse there, which was constructed of cypress wood, went into service in 1801. It didn't last long. After storm damage in 1806, it was rebuilt as a brick tower. During the Civil War, the Confederates used Georgetown Lighthouse as a lookout station until Union forces captured it in May 1862. Thank you, Michelle. We have two guests today. A little later, we're going to have another edition of Photo Tips with Mike Leonard. But first, we're going to talk with a real-life lighthouse keeper. Back in episode 21, we interviewed Ford Reiki, the owner of Halfway Rock Lighthouse. In this episode, we'll listen to an interview with Tim Bailey. Halfway Rock is a windswept, rocky ledge far out in Maine's Casco Bay, about nine miles east of Portland Head. Its name comes from its location about halfway between Cape Elizabeth and Cape Small. A 76-foot granite lighthouse tower was built on the ledge in the summer of 1871. In 1888, an attached boathouse was added with an upper story containing keeper's quarters. Halfway Rock was automated and de-staffed in 1975. The property was later made available to a new owner under the guidelines of the National Historic Lighthouse Preservation Act, but there were no applicants. As a result, it was put up for sale via online auction in May 2014. The auction ended in September 2014 with a high bid of $283,000. Since then, the owner, Ford Reiki, has completed a great deal of restoration. Tim Bailey was born in Gardner, Maine, but he spent his school years in Connecticut. After graduating from high school, Tim joined the Coast Guard. He went to boot camp at Cape May, New Jersey, and then Engineman School in Yorktown, Virginia, where his high scores allowed him to choose his assignment. He chose to go to Portland, Maine. Given a choice of assignment as a lightkeeper, Tim chose remote halfway rock over Boone Island. After his time at Halfway Rock in 1971 and 72, he was stationed at Booth Bay Harbor, Maine, then Seguin Light Station off the mouth of the Kennebec River. When he finished his Coast Guard service, he studied dairy at University of Connecticut School of Agriculture. Tim spent some time as the mechanic for the grounds crew at the VA Hospital in Newington, Connecticut, and then moved back home to Maine for good. He attempted to hike the Appalachian Trail, but knee injuries forced him to stop after 800 miles. He spent the remaining 20 plus years of his working life at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, where he worked on submarines and cranes before retiring as a tugboat engineer. In his retirement, he stays busy woodworking, gunsmithing, and reading about history at his home in Berwick, Maine. I had a chance recently to speak with Tim, mostly about his experience as a keeper at Halfway Rock, and a little bit about his time on Seguin Island. Joining me for the interview was Ford Reiki, the owner of Halfway Rock Lighthouse. Let's listen to that conversation now. I'm speaking with Tim Bailey at his home in North Berwick, Maine. Also joining us in the discussion today is Ford Reiki. And Ford and I go back a, a couple of years or so, and I actually interviewed him Last year, I just looked it up, episode 21 of the podcast in August of 2019. Ford, as I'm sure a lot of listeners know, is the owner of Halfway Rock Lighthouse and has been for how long now, Ford? Six years. Wow. Yeah. Time goes by. Ford has done an amazing restoration there. But Tim uh, was actually stationed there as a Coast Guardsman, as a Coast Guard lightkeeper. When exactly were you were you stationed at Halfway Rock? When was it? 72. I'm wondering why you joined the Coast Guard. How, how old were you at the time when you joined the Coast Guard? 19, I believe. I had my draft notice. It was a case of uh, either most likely trips and swamps over in Vietnam or for two years, joining us up for four. So I joined yeah. the Coast Guard. I went from boot camp to engineering school, 
then the Halfway Rock, then Booth Bay Harbor, small boat station, and then back out to Seguin. So I did my time. The two of us came up from Benjamin School, and uh, we got to Group Portland, and they had two billets, one for Boone Island and one for Halfway Rock. He was from the Midwest and really didn't care. I didn't know where they were. And so basically, flip of a coin, I, I grabbed Halfway Rock, and he and he ended up with Boone Island. I think if I could choose between Halfway Rock and Boone Island, it's it's a tough choice, but I think I'd take Halfway Rock. <laughs> they're, they're both sort of desolate, but uh, I think Boone Island is even more desolate than Halfway Rock, although there's a little more land around it, but not by much. Not but, by much. <laughs> yeah. So, Tim, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, when you were there, again, this was 71, 72, how many men were typically assigned there, and how many were usually uh, on the station? We had a four-man crew, and we worked two weeks on, a week off. When you're off, you weren't on call. You were mm -hmm. off. But yeah. typically, it'd be two, sometimes uh, quite often three. There was one time I was out there alone because uh, the guy I was with one morning noticed he had a line on his a red line on his wrist or on his arm. And he asked me about it. And boy, from what I've learned from first aid and whatnot, that looks like blood poisoning. So we measured it. And about a half an hour later, it was a little longer. And so we called and they came out with a boat and picked him up and took him in. And it was blood poisoning. Don't know why, but uh, I ended up out there overnight that day and overnight alone. And we called and got a hold of one of the other guys and they voluntarily came out. I was alone. You know, one night when I was out there alone. Why would they have three people on duty at any one time? You, you, there wasn't that much work to do other than mechanical maintenance, was there? It basically had to do with the rotation, how the rotation came out. Like I say, typically it was two, but sometimes it would rotate. One thing to throw a wrench in the works at the time was that winter, 71, 72. Was so uh, that was a rough winter. And we were having a lot of trouble getting off the island on time. We did logistics on Wednesdays. Uh, there was a lot of times that we, were, we wouldn't get off till Thursday, Friday, because it was just too rough. You mentioned logistics day was Wednesday. So when, when they, they would come out and tie up to the, to the mooring and you would launch the pea pod, two people, one, per, one person would be in the pea pod and one person would be running the winch, I take it, and they'd lower it down to the water line and then you'd row out? Good part of the time, there'd be two of us go off. Well, how would you land then? You just come into the land on the slip and one of the guys would jump, jump off the bow. We already typically have the cable pulled down and he'd just hook it, grab the cable, hook, throw the hook on and then run up and uh, winch us in. We often did, did it that way. I, I know how many uh, hairy hazardous landings I've had, and I always have the benefit of an outboard. You must have had uh, more than your share of scares with nothing but a pea pod to row. Actually, in reality, from my experience, if it, was, if it was really churned up, we wouldn't be going off. Yeah. But you almost always had, the swells would come around the island. You almost always had a swell coming into the island. You'd line yourself up and catch one of the swells and basically surf it in. Yeah, wow. If you needed to correct a little, all you'd do is just touch an oar just slightly. It would straighten you up. And uh, there was only one time that one of the guys missed. He got it up on the rocks a little bit. And as heavy as it, heavy as it was, it was uh, a little bit of work getting it back into the water. But yeah. she just got up on the rocks. She we pushed it back into the water and she loosened up the seams a little bit, but that was to me, that was the, the best, the best setup they had. Those pea pods were slick. It was fun for surfing it in. I love, I love doing that. Ford, uh, you, you wrote a, an excellent book, Halfway Rock Light Station. Must be two or three years ago now that that came out, right? A couple of yeah, years. Yeah. I just ordered uh, the fourth, the third printing, I guess, of the book. We've, a lot of people have bought it but it's available on Amazon and all the proceeds go to historic preservation. I highly recommend it for anybody at all interested in Halfway Rock Light Station, but anybody interested in, you know, some of the more remote rock lighthouses or wave swept lighthouses or however you want to refer to them. It's really a very comprehensive uh, book. And thank you for writing that for it. Did a great my, job. My pleasure. 
I um, wish I'd had some of Tim's photos for the book. <laughs> well, maybe it'll be another edition that'll include those at some point. Yeah. But, uh, and also, I want to mention, uh, Tim, you referred a couple of times to Frank, right? That was Frank Reese, who was another one of the, the guys assigned there at the time. Yeah, he was officer in charge most of the time I was there. Uh huh. I liked working with him. Well, that's good. That's important in a place like that. You gotta. It's a lot easier if you get along with the the guys you're working with. And speaking of that, when there were two guys on the station, did you split it into two 12-hour shifts, or how did that work? It was up to us how we wanted to do it. I think typically, typically we did 12. There was one point there where we. Um, I don't think for very long. Well, we tried 24, 24, but Oof. we didn't follow through with that. But as long as we had, as long as we had the coverage. Long before your time, it was pretty formal out there. When you, when you had your 12 hour shift, you had to either be uh, on the fifth deck, uh, which was the watch level or up on the sixth deck, just check, you know, look, doing visuals once in a while. How did, when you had your shift, where, where did you spend your time? basically down in the living area because you're talking back back when they had to maintain maintain the wicks and everything else right i mean there was a lot of maintenance there we had we had the electricity one picture you've got in the book shows it shows the lens i guess it's halfway rock the guy in the background yeah it's 1942 yeah that shows a single lamp we had a four lamp changer basically we could blow four lights before we were out. Matter of fact, there was one there was one night there that we saw a flash and I think we blew a light and uh, it was still running. One of the lamps had blown, it auto automatically flipped to the next lamp and it would have been just a brief, brief second for it to be back on. When you did a shift, Tim, you, you would you obviously you would you would keep the log at the beginning of your shift and then the end of your shift and then a couple times in between, right? I have the logs, by the way. I should look through for yeah. some of yours, some of your entries. Yeah, I think we did the log more daily, if I remember right. But I yeah, there were times that it was that it was only daily. You talked a few minutes ago about Wednesday being logistics day, but then periodically the cow slip would come and drop off big deliveries of diesel fuel and uh, what else did they bring to you? Just fuel and water. This is Jeremy. I just want to interject something here. I'm recording this uh, after the interview. Ford and Tim have referred to the cow slip. What they're talking about is the tender cow slip. It was a seagoing buoy tender launched in 1942 and decommissioned in 1973. And from 1944 until 1973, it was based in Portland, Maine. So, and you kept water in the cistern that was under the first the first level of the of the tower. Yeah. Were you feeding the cistern um, off the roof? A lot. <laughs> yeah. We get water from the cow slip twice a year. One of the deliveries we got, we started noticing uh, fuel, and it turned out the, oh, no. the cow slip's boat went and checked the lines. And it turned out that they had slipped the fuel line in with oh. our water lines. Oh, man. And so I was out there for the delivery, but then I was getting off. I didn't get the uh, the fun chore of cleaning the cistern out. And then wow, they had to, what a mess. And they had to repump it. What a mess. Uh, so I, I was off the week that all that went, <laughs> went by, which I was thankful for. What, how about inspection? So you had the cow slip was just doing delivering basic provisions. Um, did you have in formal inspections monthly or quarterly? I only remember. I think it was yearly. Yeah. I only remember one inspection. And uh, other visitors like sailors and tourists and so forth. Did you have many come ashore? Once in a while, we would have a have a boat that'd be kind of interested in you know taking a look around, and we'd go out and bring them on and. Yeah. Uh, you know, give them a look-see and uh, kind of a courtesy thing. We'd row out, they'd tie up to our buoy and we'd bring them on. And one I remember in particular, they'd been out blue fishing and they came on and they gave us some blue fish. And that, that was really good. <laughs> blue fish are good if you cook them right. They told, they how to they cook told them. us how to do it. <laughs> yeah. It came out really good. <laughs> oh yeah, good for you. I've got a friend named Tommy Thompson from Portland. When he was young, he lived on Long Island. He said there used to be a group of women that would come out to visit 
to visit in the 70s? Whether would you recall locals ever coming out to just to raise cane on the weekends? We didn't have any of that, but we used to get we used to quite often get telephone calls from from these girls or women uh, yeah. from in Portland and whatnot. You had a TV out there, so how did how did you know? What weather was coming? If there was a big storm coming, was it just off the TV? Yeah. So just to clarify things, uh, Tim, you actually lived inside the tower when you were there, right? We slept in the tower, but most of our living was in the in the house, the upstairs. The boathouse. Uh, yeah, you had, your, you had your kitchen, bathroom, living room, and uh, then there was an office off to the side. But for the most part, the tower, it was machine... You know, the uh, radio beacons, compressors, light, and then we had our bedrooms there. Mm -hmm. I mean, we didn't typically, during the day, we wouldn't be in the, in the bedroom. <laughs> there are six decks in the lighthouse. The top, the top one with the glass was number six, I guess. What level did, were the bedrooms on? Mine was the one, uh, the ridge pole, with the window at the ridge pole of the house. So that would be the second deck. So let me ask you this. Can you, going up from the first level, which was the same level as the as the boathouse upstairs, can you tell me what was on each floor as you go up through the tower? Oh, come down. You had your light, and then your lantern was two levels. Yeah, so yeah. The light, and then uh, you might see the machinery for the ro rotating. And then you had the compressor room below that. The fog signals were on that, that lower lantern level out on that lower catwalk yeah and you had two compressors two compressors on that first tower you might say tower level then below that you had your radio beacons because the bottom you had we didn't do, use it for anything was the uh cistern ac access to the cistern and then in between was the uh bedrooms so there were two bedrooms was it two or three i was on the lowest one and uh I guess it was two, yeah. How did you get food and how did you divide up the cooking responsibilities and clean up? The food, we, uh, the ones that were on would call and the ones coming on would, like the day before the, uh, like Tuesday, they would go out and uh, get the food that was needed. The milk that we got, we had to, we'd take and freeze some of it because you couldn't keep it two weeks. Considering the fact that it, it spent it would spend a good part of a day unrefrigerated. It wouldn't keep two weeks, so we'd freeze part of it. We made on halfway, we made it a point to have T bone steak once a week. But once wow. a week, I remember I don't know why it sticks, but we got seventy seven ten a month. We found that we could get we could get by with thirty five. And so basically we were we were living out there on thirty five a week. Wow. Thirty five times four. Cool. And and we'd pocket the rest of it. So we're looking at this this photo of you and Frank Reese having Thanksgiving dinner. I can see a turkey, maybe a can of cranberry sauce. Looks like some cider, maybe cranberry juice. Probably didn't eat like that very often. No, that was that was exception. Actually, yeah. that period right there, one of the guys was uh, looking to get home. I don't remember who it was now. Was looking to get home over the holidays. At that point, I stayed out there from uh, Thanksgiving to Christmas. I was out there. So what did you normally eat? What was tip typical diet uh, for $35? We were eating good. I mean, we weren't eating T-bone steak every day, but we were eating decent. He asked about cooking and cleaning, and we worked it out between us. I don't remember just, I don't remember specific details, to be honest with you. You know, it just worked out. When we talked on the phone, you told me about a spaghetti dinner you had one time. It was kind of, <laughs> kind of memorable. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, we were, uh, I think that may have been after the storm. We went to cook some spaghetti up, and one of the guys ends up getting mixed up on where the shaker was on the uh, red pepper he was going to put in. <laughs> and he gave, took the top off, and he gave it a shake. The entire contents? The bottle was completely open, and so we ended up with most of the bottle in the pot. We started digging it out a little bit, and he got frustrated and just stirred it up. And I just rolled my eyes and I don't believe this. <laughs> Nobody could get it by their lips. It was so hot. And uh, one of us, I don't remember which one it was, one of us got the idea, well, seagulls will eat anything. We took and put, put a plate of it out by out on the rocks out 
out away from the house. And then we stood there watching and a seagull came in and uh, he takes a couple bites. And I've never seen a seagull do a vertical takeoff, but he did. <laughs> he went straight up quite a ways. And then it did a nosedive into the water. There was one other one took a took a look, couple bites and he took off. And then after that, there wasn't anything that come near it. So Tim, we've referred a few times to a big storm that happened while you were there. That was February 72. Could you maybe give us a little more detail of what that storm did, what the experience was like and what kind of damage it did? I remember Frank and I came on the day before and looking from the house, we came up on the left-hand slip and we didn't typically drag the boat inside. Once you, uh, you just drag it up onto the floor and it was, it was some work pushing it back out onto the slip. You'd leave it on the slip. And uh, I remember he was on at least, you might say mid watch. And he woke me up that morning. I came down and I went to the window overlooking the uh, slip. And I looked down and I see the boat. And I asked him, should we come up on the left? Well, we knew it was starting to build up, build up some. We need to pull the boat in. <laughs> the boat was sitting on the right hand side. Water had come and picked the boat up and shifted it to the other side. Thankfully, it went the right way. So we dragged it in and then it just kept building more. The first thing to go was the uh, porch that they had just put on. A little bit before I got out there, they'd put the porch on new. And that went away. It was coming over. And at some point we lost our, we lost our generators. And- so Tim, if I, if I can interrupt you, Tim, for you to have lost the porch the water had to be up in the generators, right? You have to remember it's washing over. It wasn't like a flood as such. Yeah, okay. It was was washing over, it was wave action. It did take, down in that lower section, it was heavy planked and I didn't realize it until after, but they caulked it with oakum. Between the planks, it was caulked with oakum, like a ship. And it, it actually drove the oakum out of the planking. We had inch and a half, two inches of water steady running across the floor and out the door because it was just, you know, washing through the wall. The generators went, well, the generator, I should say, it went down because they, you, you ran on port starboard. You know, we'd run one one week and we'd run the other one the next week, all day and week to week. And then we could do maintenance on the one that was down. By rights, we should have had a third generator, but there's no room for one. So we had two. He had two 1,500-gallon tanks there, and we had just taken fuel on. We had two 1,500-gallon tanks, and underneath, we had a 275-gallon tank laid down, and uh, that washed out. That 275-gallon went out, went out between the uh, boathouse and the uh, paint locker, went out through that hole, and yeah. there, was a, there was a pipe railing that went around from the paint locker, around the corner to the boat slip. And it took the pipe railing out with it. Uh, you had wave action that would have been three or four feet at least uh, higher than the walking surface in the boathouse, the lower level. We had a lot more than that. We lost clapboards, we lost our gutter system. It twisted the radio tower. The, the window you see over top of the, over top of the ridge pole. On uh, the tower. That was my bedroom. The window on the opposite, the east side, three swells came through that. I don't know how many hit it, but I know one one broke it out. Matter of fact, it soaked my rack. One broke Amazing. it out, and then two more came through afterwards. Where were you? We were in the house at the time. When we racked out that night, we went up to the floor above it and racked out. So did you have water coming into the upper level of the boathouse? Probably hitting the windows, at least. It was probably splashing the windows. But like I say, it, it was it was big big swells coming across, and the tower was doing the break in the brunt of it. Was it creaking? I don't me- I don't remember that tower moving. Matter of fact, I don't remember when we were in the house that the, that the house was shaking. Interesting. We were a little concerned about the house. We took and moved a bunch of canned goods and stuff into the tower, and we left the doors open. So if we had an indication that the house was starting to give, we were hoping that we could make a beeline into the tower, but we never had to. But I think I'd have been scared. <laughs> I don't know. We just kind of wasn't much anything anybody was going to do. We basically had nothing to do. We were dead in the water, and there was nobody getting to us. 
So what do you do? You just ride it out. We managed to sleep the night. We weren't confident enough in the house to, to sleep in the house. We slept in the tower. Like I say, I don't remember it shaking. So the uh, the old third order Fresnel lens was still uh, in the lighthouse when you were there, right? That lens, I remember it was it was marked and it was dated. It was dated concurrent to I don't remember 1860s, 70s. That's uh, right. It was it was built at the time of the lighthouse, all brass frame, crystal crystal lenses. Sure, it was beautiful. Uh, How often did you polish that lens? How often did you clean it? I don't remember how often, but we did clean it. I can't tell you just how often we did. Yeah. We were really careful when we were cleaning it because we understood that you couldn't replace the lenses if you broke any. I think there was a couple a couple pieces missing down at the bottom. The ones in the very top, you couldn't get them completely clean because they were stained from the oil. Mm. The oil lamp staining was permanent in the glass. But that was just in the very top the very top. Speaking of the lens, you told me about a, a time a, a sea duck actually did some some damage. I went up there one morning doing rounds, and uh, there was a bunch of glass and a sea duck down on the uh, the lower level of the light, the lens, just kind of flopping around, all busted up. He went busted the uh, storm pane, busted the storm pane out. By the looks of the by the looks of the hole, he was moving along. I don't remember it getting fixed before I got off. But it didn't damage the Fresnel lens, right? No, no. That was thick glass. I've heard about similar incidents at other lighthouses with ducks oh, yeah. and other, other birds hitting the lantern sometimes. Oh, yeah. yeah. So the foghorn was ran on air compressors, right? It uh, used compressed yeah. air. What kind of work was required to get the, the horn going? And two-part question and when when did you know it was time to put the horn on well the second part we we gauged by jewel island if we lost visibil visibility of jewel about four miles away i think it was we would uh turn the fog signal on and that was that was basically a matter of turning the starting the compressors it was time to the radio beacon which i thought i i thought that was a good system it's too bad they still don't have it because the way the way it worked, there was six station six stations on the our radio beacon sequence. So once once every six minutes you would transmit. And I was looking it up, I was looking up the other day in the light list. We were uh, the letter O dash dash dash. I I didn't remember. I had to look it up. But in any case, when our minute came up, we would broadcast O O O for fifty seconds. The 50th second, we'd count down, you'd get a, a beep every minute, every second, for the mm -hmm. last 10 seconds. On the 10th beep, our fog signal would go off. So if you were on a boat and you're listening to your radio beacon and you had a watch, you could tell by the beep and when you heard the fog signal, and I forget the I forget the uh, ratio for the uh, for the difference in radio and sound. You could tell how far off you were by the difference in time. Ford has an appointment, needs to leave us at this point. I've got a few more questions for Tim. So thank you uh, for taking part in this, Ford. And I'm, I'm sure you got some, a lot of useful information. One more fun project I've had with you, Jeremy, and it was just great to meet you, Tim. Thank you to you, Tim, and to your daughter for making this, connect, this great connection. I hope to, hope to talk to you again sometime. It'd be nice to be able to connect up with you. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to do that be interesting to go out and see it, see the work you've done. Well, I'd love to show it to you. Just talking about the foghorn, what was the longest stretch you ever had the foghorn going when you were there? There again, sure it was Frank and I. We ended up our full two weeks with the fog signal running. Wow. Basically went our full two weeks. A couple of times we, uh, we'd catch a glimpse of Jewel Island and, oh, good. And we'd run up and shut the, shut the compressors off. And then we don't want to get down, and uh, it was closed in again. Yeah. Run, after a couple of those, we just, unless we got a good, we know we've got it. Well, <laughs> this is foolishness. <laughs> it would boil down to, if you were in the house watching TV, when the fog signal went off, basically you read lips. If you turn the TV up enough, 
that you could hear it over the fog signal. You couldn't stand it the rest of the time. <laughs> and then you slept in the tower, even worse. And actually, I've got a hearing loss in my left ear that I'm sure is from a combination of the horn and the generators, but I never got it documented. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, did you have trouble sleeping when the horn was going? You must have. Definitely. That, yeah. was, that was a bad, I liked it out there, but that was a bad two weeks right there. Yeah. It was almost impossible to sleep. That was probably the worst, worst time I had out there. That was probably, that was worse than the storm, I think. <laughs> right. Because it lasted longer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You told me a story uh, about the time the Coast Guard dropped off a new air compressor on the helicopter pad and didn't go so well. <laughs> that was after the February storm. They brought a compressor. I think that was about the time I was, about the time I was leaving the island, but they brought a compressor out. I think it was going to be for fixing the, uh, the boat slip in the, um, uh, helicopter pad, but we got wind that there was a blow coming up. And so we, uh, went out and lashed, lashed the compressor down to the pad eyes on the helicopter pad. I thought we did anyway. And it was another one that washed over the top of the island. I mean, nothing like February, but the top of the island was washing over. Well, it broke our lashing loose. And so the compressors floating around, bouncing between the helicopter pad and the boat slip. And we uh, didn't really want to lose it. So we, <laughs> two of us are down there and uh, we uh, tried to play cowboy. We, man we managed eventually to lasso the tongue and we used the uh, boat winch to pull it in and uh, pulled it up along the wall underneath the boat slip, mm -hmm. but it got flooded and bashed up and it, it was destroyed. We saved it from going over the side, but that's about all we did. So Tim, you, you told me about something interesting that happened at Halfway Rock. You saw something unusual that you, you have trouble explaining. Can you, can you tell me about that? I can't give you just exactly when it was, but I was uh, currently on watch and I went to get the, uh, uh, it was in the evening, and I went to check the weather conditions, send in the weather report, and I see this kind of funny colored light running along at high speed. It seemed a fair amount off the water to not necessarily be a boat, but it was moving pretty fast and, you know, kind of varying colors. And uh, I forget who was out. It might have been Gasper who was out with me, but I called him out and he saw it. And it, it traveled along for a ways. And then it did a perfect vertical, 90 degree, straight up. And what on earth is that thing? <laughs> and uh, when I called the weather in, I mentioned it, mentioned it to the radio man at the base. And uh, apparently they called Brunswick. And next thing we knew, there was a couple of fighters out there flying around. And uh, so apparently it didn't have anything to do with the Navy or probably the government. Got no idea what they saw. Not exactly into UFO type things, but it's not something that I could put any um, definition on. Yeah. Explanation to either. Yeah, yeah. You don't travel at speed and do a ninety. You do an arc. I don't. I don't. To this day, I got no idea what what we saw. Uh, but there yeah. was two of us that saw it, and like I say, apparently the Navy scr scrambled a couple fighters out. We never heard word one. Didn't know if we'd get some flack or questions, or we didn't hear a thing about it afterwards. Whether it just brushed under the carpet, I, I wouldn't even speculate about, about what it was. Like I say, it seemed like it was, it was a clear night. It seemed like a higher, too high to be like a masthead light or anything like that, but not high elevation either. And we didn't hear any sound either. What it was, I can't even speculate. You spent a little less than two years, right, at Halfway Rock? Is that, is that about right? Closer to a year, actually, right? Yeah. And then you went on to Seguin Lighthouse, light station off uh, the mouth of the Kennebec. How did you like Seguin? How did that compare to Halfway Rock? Actually, I, I was at Booth Bay Harbor in between. In between, okay. Halfway Rock, we did, we did the logistics with the light ship, the Portland light ship. In fact, I've got some pictures of the light ship uh, alongside. I never got on it. When I was at Booth Bay, we did logistics with the Cuckles, Manan Island Fog Signal Station, and Seguin. I was getting my time on at Booth Bay, and then I heard that there was somebody coming 
one of the engineers was coming off Seguin, so I put in for it and I got it. And I wasn't out there for a full year. I liked Halfway Rock better. It wasn't as nice. I mean, Seguin, Seguin really was quite a nice station. You're almost like you're on mainland, except you can't go to town. But I mean, we had a drilled well. I don't know how they ever got a drilling rig up there, but there was a drilled well. We had shore power, so we only had a standby generator. Getting up and down from the from the water up to the top was a challenge, but but we had a tramway. Halfway Rock gave you more. You were down near the water and you know around around the water a lot more. You got out and did a lot of macro fishing and. Let me ask you a couple of kind of general questions. For you, what would you say was the best thing about being a lighthouse keeper for the Coast Guard? Best thing? Best thing, yeah. Probably that we were only kind of loosely military. <laughs> really loose. <laughs> it was almost like being a civilian. You're kind of on your own in a lot of ways. Yeah. For being in the military, it was pr pretty free. But you like you liked it at Halfway Rock. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it had. I don't think. I don't think the isolation affected me as much as it sounds like it affected a lot of them. But it could get to you some at times. You know, especially that probably as much as anything that's that stretch between Thanksgiving and Christmas. I mean, that was my own choice. Just too, I was single at the time. Well, it sounds like it was mostly a positive experience. Let me ask you this. If you could do it all over again, would you do that over again? If you could be be young again, would you join the Coast Guard and take these lighthouse assignments again? If you uh, if you had the chance? Yeah, I think I would. Yeah, I yeah I liked it, and especially uh, when you put it against most military service. I don't I don't regret it. I got some you know engineering school and you know got some good experience. I'm sure it had a lot to do with maybe being able to get on the tugboats and force with Navy Yard too. Your your Coast Guard career wasn't really long, but you had some really interesting experiences. That's for sure. Yeah, it was it was good. I, I like you know, Booth Bay was a good good duty too. Well, you got some great memories, and uh, I appreciate you sharing them. And you know, you've got a got a good memory for all this stuff that that, that happened. It was it was a couple of years ago. But yeah. uh, and the other great thing, as we talked about a little before, is that you took all these the pictures you took because not that many Coast Guard guys at, at lighthouses did that. It's uh, I've only found a few others, you know, whoever did anything like that. It's pretty rare. I wish I had had a better camera. I wish I had taken a little more detail and maybe taken some pictures, more pictures of some of the crew. You know, there's things that you kind of wish you'd. But but, you got a lot of good stuff, and like I said, it's it's rare and it's it's like treasure to have any of that for somebody right. like like me or like Ford Reiki it's like it's like finding buried treasure Tim Bailey it's been great talking to you today a real life lighthouse keeper uh, at halfway rock and and Seguin Island and uh, I also want to thank even though he had to to uh, leave us a little while ago uh, Ford Reiki who took part in the interview uh, the owner of halfway rock lighthouse and again people should uh, read his book if they're interested uh, halfway rock light station. But Tim, again, thanks so much for sharing your memories with us. I really appreciate it. Okay, thank you. I wanna thank Jessie Littlefield, Tim Bailey's daughter, who put me in touch with her dad. And special thanks to Ford Reiki for taking part in the interview. Ford is always very generous in sharing his research about Halfway Rock Lighthouse. Next, we're going to listen to another edition of Photo Tips with Mike Leonard. Mike lives in Yarmouth, Maine, and his photography is frequently seen in books and magazines and in television segments. Mike offers workshops on digital photography, which you can read about on his website at phototourismbymike.com. He appears on this podcast now and then to share his knowledge of digital photography. Let's listen now to this installment of Photo Tips with Mike Leonard. I'm speaking with my friend Mike Leonard this afternoon, and uh, Mike's up in Yarmouth, Maine, about about an hour or so north of where I am in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. How are things in Yarmouth today, Mike? Well, today we've had a little bit of snow. Some of this white stuff that comes down this time of year is, uh, well, I guess it's to be expected, but it's one of those things that I, I'm, I, I'd rather not see. <laughs> well, it can make for some nice photos sometimes, but shoveling it is no fun at all. Yeah, we're getting light snow here today, too. A few days after that storm that dumped about a foot here, that's enough for, for this year. I don't, I don't particularly <laughs> want any more. 
It's good to be talking with you again. And what will be our subject for today's Photo Tips with Mike Leonard? Well, a lot of people uh, like to take pictures of lighthouses. I, I realize that. And I'm of the type that I like to take a picture of the lighthouse working. And the time you see lighthouses really working is at night. Not all lights, and you could probably talk to this, Jeremy, are illuminated during the day. Uh, some, I know, only uh, light up at night. And so to that end, I thought I would uh, pass along some tips that I have found work well for photographing lighthouses after the sun has gone down. There's a couple of things that we need to think about, and uh, we can start with some camera settings. First of all, if you're shooting with a uh, DSLR, digital camera, all we're doing is we're looking to collect light whenever we take a picture. And I've often said you can put that on your business cards. If you own a camera, you're a light collector. That can be your new title. <laughs> what we're looking to do, though, is we're looking to capture this light, but we need to do some settings so that we can make it look the best. I think the, one of the easier ways to take a photograph, an evening shot of a lighthouse, is just after dusk because you still have a little bit of ambient light in the sky. If you're shooting with a cell phone that's, or, uh, or some camera that doesn't have a whole lot of settings, that can perhaps be the, the best time of the day to shoot. And that's usually when these lighthouses light up. And uh, for the ones that flash, naturally you need to time this and you want to take the picture when the light is on. But if you're going to go into wanting to photograph the lighthouse when it's a little bit darker... There's just some things that we need to think about. First of all, we really want to know how to set up your camera for manual mode for photographing. I highly recommend doing this before you go out there at night to take this picture. Practice this. Rehearse this. You can do this in, in a dark room at home. And why I say that is, is nothing more frustrating than being on location and trying to read through an instruction book, and especially in the dark. So this is something you can rehearse at home. You can do this before you go out, and I highly recommend it. In manual mode, that's where you can set the shutter speed and the aperture. Shutter speed is simply measured in time. It's usually in fractions of seconds. But when we're taking pictures at night, we need to leave the shutter open for a longer period of time to collect that light. Something I like to equate this to, imagine holding a cup underneath a dripping faucet. Can you fill the cup? Absolutely, but it takes a lot of time. See, during the day, we've got the uh, sun, and that's like a fire hose. It's going to fill that cup really fast, and that's why we would only have to hold that under that hose for a fraction of a second. But for nighttime, what we need to do is to leave that shutter open for a longer period of time and so that we can capture all of the light. Now, another consideration is your autofocus is probably not going to work. And autofocus works best when you have a lot of light. So you'll need to switch this to manual focus. And I like to use a mode called live view, and that gives you the ability to see on your view screen in the camera what you're shooting. And when the light is on on the lighthouse or if there's some other light around or, you know what I like to do, I bring a flashlight or even a laser pointer and I will focus on it to get it tack sharp. Mm -hmm. And that's how I get my focus to be very sharp. Otherwise, your camera may not even take the picture. A lot of these DSLRs, if it can't focus, it won't shoot. And so you need to put that into manual mode. You may have to take a couple of pictures and see how they look, see how sharp they are. And if they're not sharp, you'll just have to make the readjustment right there in the field. And then I think the, the last one that can be uh, an important setting on your camera, and that's white balance. Now, hopefully people may have heard the uh, one of the prior talks that I have done on your podcast where I discuss how important it is to capture in raw mode. When you capture in raw it's like going to the grocery store and bringing home the entire grocery store, as opposed to when you capture only in JPEG, that's like going to the grocery store and only bringing home a couple of bags of groceries. So you need to, you want to bring everything in. You, you don't want to leave anything behind. By capturing in RAW, you can set the white balance after the fact. 
but it's nice to at least get it close. I always say white balance is embarrassingly simple because they spell it right out. They'll say cloudy, daylight, tungsten, or sometimes it might say incandescent. If you don't understand the words, there's a little icon of a cloud, of a sun, <laughs> of a light bulb. And, and if you are a mathematician, well, some cameras you can dial in the color temperature in degrees Kelvin. And as I also like to tell people, if English isn't your native language, well, you've got about 12 different languages that most cameras can be set to. This is how simple white balance is. There's no reason to have it in auto. So just set the white balance. Make an attempt. What is white balance? We're adjusting the camera to capture under a certain quality of light, a certain color of light. Now, we can discuss light in lots of different ways. We can talk about the direction of light. We can talk about the brightness of the light. Uh, we can talk about uh, how diffuse light is. But in this case, we're talking about the color of the light. If you don't think light has color, any time you travel at night, look at oncoming headlights, and you'll see some look bluish and some look orange cast. They're all about the same brightness. It's just that to our eyes, uh, they're just different colors. With respect to the lighthouses, a lot of lighthouses, and you can talk to this, Jeremy, are going from the quartz-type light to the LED-type light. A couple of examples. The lighthouse that I've photographed before that's off of Southport Island, the Cuckles, now has an LED light. Now, the difference is an LED light is daylight balanced versus a quartz bulb is incandescent or tungsten balanced. So what this means is when you set up your camera to take the picture, when I go to do the, the lighthouse, I have to put that into daylight white balance so that the light looks white. If I have it in tungsten, it's going to look very blue. Conversely, if I'm going to go and take a picture of, let's say, Portland headlight, that uses, at the moment, as of our recording, that uses a tungsten or a quartz-based light. And if I have my camera set to daylight, the light coming out of that light is going to look very orange, which is not what our eye sees. Our eyes always make everything look white, for the most part. But the camera sees colors uh, a little more critically. And so when we're going to go and photograph the lighthouse, we have to know what kind of light is that we're photographing. Now, the beauty of digital cameras is after you've taken the picture, you can instantly see, and then you could go and make an adjustment. And if you're capturing in RAW, you can go and adjust that later. So it's not as important. But if your camera only captures in JPEG, you have to get it right while you're there in the field. You don't have a whole lot of wiggle room after the fact. You have a little bit, but not the scope that you'd have if you capture in RAW. And that's why I'm always promoting, always capture in RAW. It makes a lot more sense to do that. So let's talk about the different lights that we see along the coast and how they light. Some are fixed, some flash, and some have a rotating beacon. So let's talk about some examples of different lights that we might see that we might want to photograph. So in the fixed category, Marshall Point is one that comes to mind, and maybe you know some others, but... The, uh, the light there is on continuously. And when you go to take a picture of that, what we might have to do is, because the contrast between that really bright light compared to the background stars, for instance, or Milky Way is, or some, some other celestial body in the background, we might have to do something that's called exposure bracketing. And what that simply means is we're going to take a number of shots where one of those shots will expose for the light on the lighthouse that's on continuously. And then another shot we will actually take to expose for the stars. Now, in one scenario, you won't see the stars. And in the other scenario, the light's going to be really blown out. So what we need to do is to take many steps in between. And then we can process all of those photos as an HDR or high dynamic range photograph. And it'll take the best tonality out of each image to give you one image that your eye more likely saw. Now, that does require some processing, post-processing. But the good news is a lot of the DSLR cameras that are sold today, some of the newer ones, 
have built-in HDR, and that's high dynamic range. Let's talk about a, uh, a light that flashes. Can you uh, give an example of one of those? Well, we have a bunch of uh, flashing lights on the New England coast. One of the most popular ones would be Nubble Light in mm. uh, York, Maine, otherwise known as Cape Netic Light. That has a an old fourth order Fresnel lens, you know, the classical glass lens with the flashing red light, mm. but also a red acrylic cylinder surrounding the lens. So it's a little bit of an unusual setup. Another pop, really popular lighthouse that has a flashing white light inside of a Fresnel lens is Pemaquid Point. Mm -hmm. uh, really, really popular one. But then you have some of these flashing LED lights. You mentioned Cuckolds earlier. That's one that has a, a flashing LED. Whaleback Lighthouse near me uh, in Kittery, Maine, and also near Portsmouth, New Hampshire, that has a flashing LED as well. Hmm. So let's say if you wanted to capture one of those after the sun has gone down, and maybe you're not into doing processing, or maybe you don't have a friend who works in Photoshop. Well, there are some ways that you can still capture that, and it is a little trick to this. First of all, you have to really study the rhythm of the light to know when it's going to illuminate. And what I will do, the magic, if you will, is you set the camera to do a long exposure, the longest you can. You may even have to put it into bulb mode and have a shutter release cable to lock it. If you don't have that ability, just go with the longest mode you can get. And I use a black pair of glove liners that are not at all reflective. You set the camera up to photograph the lighthouse that's got the flashing light. And again, you have to watch the rhythm of this if you can uh, time this. And what I will do is open the shutter and I'll put my hand over the lens, not touching the camera though, but I'll put it over to block the light. And then I'll watch the lighthouse. And when the lighthouse lights, I keep my hand there. And when the light goes off, I move my hand away. Now, what I'm capturing at that point is the ambient light, the background light, and the picture, uh, the, whatever light might be on the lighthouse itself. I put my hand back, let the lighthouse blink on, flash on, and then go off. Then I move my hand away to collect light again. And I might have to do that for several cycles to get the light in the background to, to light up the scene, if you will. And then what I will do is I'll move my hand away, let the light flash once, I'll capture that, then I close the shutter. So let's just review. What are we doing here? <laughs> it's like uh, when that light is on in the lighthouse, remember, that's so much brighter than any stars or any background light. So what we need to do is we need to collect light of the background for a longer period of time and collect when that light comes on for a shorter period of time, namely just for one flash is all it takes. By doing it that way, you can end up with a result that looks really nice. And you can see an example of this that I've sent to be posted. Uh, and the picture that I've got that shows this technique, where I use this technique, is Portland Headlight. Mm -hmm. Now, Portland Headlight doesn't per se have a flashing light that's got the rotating beacon. But from a photographer perspective, it might as well be a flashing light because at one moment that light is facing you and all the rest of the time it's facing away from you and so using the same technique of putting your hand over the lens when the light comes toward you and then take your hand away you can get a very satisfactory shot and it looks very nice and you don't have to do as much editing after the fact right i'll just mention mike that Whatever samples you give to me that you're referring to now will be posted on the U.S. Lighthouse Society's news blog, same place where the uh, each week's podcast is posted. So if people go to news, N-E-W-S dot U-S-L-H-S dot org or O-R-G, they can see these pictures. Of course, if they're listening via podcast app on a smartphone or something like that, they'll need to get on, their, uh, on the Internet and, again, go to news dot U-S-L-H-S dot org. The three samples that uh, got to show 
first of all, Portland headlight that shows the, the rotating beacon, the uh, sample of the cuckles that has a LED light where I had to adjust the white balance to make that look uh, the proper color. And then I've got a picture from Wes Quaddy where I took advantage of a phenomena that happens around lighthouses, and that is because you're right on the coast, there's uh, always a bit of mist in the air. It's like a fog, but and the light will refract off of that moisture in the air, and you can get some very nice effects of the light around the lighthouse. That brings me to another point, and that is even if it's foggy, if you can get close enough to the lighthouse, you can usually make some very interesting shots. There's this wagon wheel effect that you can get when you look straight up at a lighthouse when you have just enough fog. And when the light's on, uh, you get this uh, light that's uh, emitting from the actual lantern area of the lighthouse. But because there are the uh, fixtures that hold the glass in place, it looks it gives an effect like a wagon wheel. That's all I can say. <laughs> I know exactly and, uh, what you mean. Yeah. And, and that makes for a very interesting photograph if you have that opportunity. So if it's uh, foggy, don't, don't think you have to put your camera away. Right. A little bit of fog is a great thing for these photos, in, in my experience. And uh, you might even get to uh, hear a foghorn, too, <laughs> depending upon which lighthouse you might be at. So I know we've covered a lot of ground here with respect to uh, the settings for your cameras and that. But again, these are all things that are very doable. And you can rehearse this at home before you go out. And I'd highly recommend that. And of course, I think it goes without saying, if you're going to be doing any nighttime photography, a tripod, a good solid tripod is a must. And as far as equipment goes, a uh, regular DSLR camera will do fine. There's really no need to have to go and buy any specialty lenses. Just the walk-around lens that came with your camera will work. I would recommend a shutter release cable because those can be invaluable for doing uh, the longer uh, exposures, especially if you go to bulb mode. And uh, if you do processing, certainly Adobe Photoshop is uh, a great application and if you don't do the processing, you probably know somebody who does. And there are services out there. In fact, I make a service of processing photos. And uh, you could certainly uh, upload the photos and have them uh, developed, if you will, just like in the day when you send away your negative or slide films to have them developed. Uh, there are uh, services out there that will take your digital file and we'll enhance it and then send it back to you in a format that's ready to be printed at whatever size you want. So it takes all the guesswork out of that. As always, Mike, those are some really good tips. You know, I've uh, I've gotten a lot of good pictures, I would say, at sunset and sunrise, but mm -hmm. not many night pictures that I consider very good at all, and uh, I'd like to get better at it. And definitely going to try some of your tips. If people are interested in learning more about what you do, and I, I, I know you offer some workshops, including night photography, how can they find out more about that? I'm available in a couple of ways. I do have a website. It's phototourismbymike.com. And uh, at that site, you will see a listing of events that I've got coming up. Also, there's a Facebook page that's also Photo Tourism by Mike. And at the Facebook page, I'm able to be a little more nimble about posting things that I've got going, as well as uh, if uh, something comes together at the last minute, <laughs> I try and post it there. And uh, I do have uh, some photo workshops and photography cruises that will be coming up this summer and I'm looking forward to getting all those dates posted as soon as I've got uh, all of that together. It's still a little early in the year to uh, nail down some of those dates at this point. And also at my uh, web page, uh, you'll see there's a list of photo services that I do. And if there's something that uh, might uh, be a need that you've been looking for, certainly I would entertain uh, being contacted. All right. Well, Mike, it's always a pleasure doing these segments with you. Your tips are always fun and, and very useful. And I want to thank you again. And I know we'll be doing it again in the not-too-distant future. 
And uh, again, people should check out your website, phototourismbymike.com. Thank you so much, Mike. Well, thank you for having me again. And I look forward to addressing your audience again. Thanks, as always, to all the members, volunteers, and staff of the U.S. Lighthouse Society. Go online to uslhs.org to learn more about the Society and all the things it offers, including tours, preservation grants, their quarterly journal, the Lighthouse Passport Program, and more. Donations to the U.S. Lighthouse Society support the organization and all its education and preservation efforts, including this podcast. Next week's episode of Lighthearted will include an interview with Dan Spinella of Artworks Florida, who has created incredible replicas of historic Fresnel lighthouse lenses. We'll also talk with Scottish architect Alan Dunlop, who has completed a beautiful series of sketches of lighthouses in Scotland. Thanks to everyone out there who's involved with the preservation of lighthouses or history of any kind. We're all on the same team. As always, thanks for listening and keep a good light. I'm gonna let it shine all in my heart. I'm gonna let it shine all in my heart. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine.